Good evening to everybody. We are glad to be together on this rainy evening and uh, glad that we have our visitors and glad we have our regular members as well. If you went to the meal tonight, uh, there was a key necklace left. And I'll set it up here if you uh, need that key, if it goes to something one way or the other. If not, maybe somebody's anniversary is coming up. As far as our announcements, uh, Janine is doing much better. Janine Crocker, she's doing much better. Uh, Pat Jarrett has just checked into the hospital over in Mayfield. Uh, she's having some uh, chest pains and heart conditions. And so she has checked in over there tonight. So we need to check on her also a little bit later. <coughs> um, the, a lot of our youth group has gone tonight. Travis has taken them along with some other adults to uh, Millington, Tennessee. I was with them earlier this week. Uh, they found a, um, a, an old school, and they have been uh, clearing a lot of land and painting the buildings and moving furniture and such. And uh, they're opening up a, a preschool, and they're also, uh, we had one of the first church services in that building last night. But um, we've got about 12 of our youth, and they have about 20 of their members and we've been working together. I hope to have some more of those pictures. If you've seen them on Facebook, or we'll have them in our bulletin this next week. But it's been going really, really well. They had church services last night. They also met with the uh, church in Millington as well. I think tonight they're going to a ball game since they had the uh, church service last night. And um, just to prove how southern we are, tomorrow they're going to the Bass Pro Shop in Memphis. So that ought to be a lot of fun. So that'll be good as well. Uh, we'll have a prayer. We'll have our uh, singing here in just a little bit. Our speaker tonight is Josh Herndon. Uh, usually we don't invite all of our speakers back year after year, but we invite Josh back every single year because he's one of our favorite speakers who's here. He wasn't on the schedule, but at Bobble Bow I saw his beard, and I said, we've got to make an exception. But we have already patted him down to make sure there's no suicide vest. We have already checked him out and made sure that he does not say Alu Akbar or whatever it is. And uh, so far, we think it's going to be all right. But you've got to be careful tonight because he's going to preach a sermon. So don't just focus on the beard. There's more to him than just the beard. But Josh, we're really glad that you're here. Corey's going to lead our singing or lead a prayer. Then we'll have our song. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day, thankful for the opportunity for us to be here and just be together, uh, Father, to spend time with one another in fellowship and in study of your word. Thankful for Josh and for his ability to uh, bring your word to, to uh, others and uh, not only to his own congregation, but to other congregations and just to people in general. It's a, a true gift, Father, and we're thankful for him. We're thankful for the work that he does uh, here and he does uh, here in this county pray that you'll be with our church that you will help us um, as we continue to uh, meet here that we will be a light in our community and that we'll be um, spoken well of father and that people will know that this is a place where they can come and, and find uh, love and help father we're thankful for uh Mark and we're thankful for Travis and for all the labors that they do here we're thankful for all of those that work behind the scenes uh, that don't do it for any kind of personal glory at all and we're thankful for them and we just pray that you would bless all of those uh, that give of their time on a daily basis here Father we're grateful for the many blessings that you give to us we're thankful uh, for uh, all the things that you do for us and we just pray that you'll uh, bless, continue to bless us spiritually, and um, we pray that you'll protect us, Father, both physically and spiritually as we go throughout this week. Thank you most of all for your son and his death on the cross, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you again as we approach your throne. We thank you, Lord, for so many things that you give us daily. And Father, we thank you especially for your word, and we pray that tonight that your word will reach our hearts and touch our hearts, and that we will reflect on your word, and we will study your word, and that we will take what we hear tonight and apply it to our lives. Help us always to be the people that you want us to be, always looking to do the work that you want us to do, and we thank you so much for what you've done for us, and we thank you for this congregation and all the congregations here in this area, and help us to continue to reach out into our community and, and bring others to Christ, and these things we ask in Christ's name, amen. It's great to uh, be here at Benton again. Things have changed a little in my appearance since last year. I have gained five pounds. <laughs> I didn't think anyone would have noticed. No, I now have a beard that people are commenting on on a regular occasion. If you saw Mark's awesome Facebook post that other people have sent me private messages and public messages about uh, I've been called various things since I grew this thing on my face. My elders at uh, Union Hill have actually threatened to renegotiate my contract to include how long your beard can be while you're preaching at Union Hill. I've been compared to various people you may know. I've been called Fidel Castro, the younger version, not the 80-year-old version of today. I've been compared to a suspicious-looking Middle Eastern man and urged not to walk through airports when they're on high alert security. I've been called a member of the Amish Mafia, which that is an Amish hat that I am wearing that was given to me on a senior citizen's trip, but that's another story altogether. I've been called a uh, Jewish rabbi of the Old Testament order, without the curls, of course. And my personal favorite came from my loving wife, when I put on a hoodie one morning and walked into the kitchen and she said, I'm married to the Unabomber. <laughs> she didn't say like she was excited or encouraged by that. She made no attempts at all to hide the fact that she does not approve of my facial hair. But my mom joined into the issue and made me feel a whole lot better <laughs> and uh, saying that this was a family thing when it came to the beard because this is a picture of my great, great, great grandfather who fought in the Civil War. His name was George Washington Barrow. 
And what mom said was that I'm trying to keep the beard alive, uh, you know, because it's in the blood, it's in the family. So I'm glad that we could go over some of these things, uh, some of these things that you've already said to me and expressed to me in conversations before I got up here. Um, but I'm glad we had a few laughs too, because uh, I'm usually a pretty upbeat guy. I like uh, to keep things pretty light. Uh, I don't watch depressing movies because why would you want to pay to cry? <laughs> But there's something that uh, I do want to share with you because of what has happened in my life over the last six months. <clears throat> in January, <clears throat> I lost my sister. She was a 37-year-old mother of three. There were 13, nine, and five when she died. She loved to help people. She loved to smile. She loved to work with people. She loved to watch her sons play baseball. But she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer uh, three years ago. She never smoked. It was just one of those freak things. She made it two years longer than the doctors originally gave her. And it was tough this past weekend because she would always get the family together on Memorial Day and go to the graveyards to see where our great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were buried, and Saturday was the first time um, I had been back to her grave, and it was really tough. And here's what I want you to get out of this lesson. There are times in your life where you are not going to be able to change the situation no matter how badly you want to change it. No matter how hard you pray about it. And no matter how much you want that pain to go away, it won't. There are times where you will not be able to change whatever it is that has happened to you, whatever it is that you have lost, no matter how much you want it to. And you will have to live with that pain for the rest of your life. Paul prayed three times to have that thorn in the flesh removed. And I'm pretty sure that Paul had a, a better and stronger prayer life than I do. But God did not remove Paul's thorn. God simply said, my grace is sufficient. And Paul had to live with the circumstance and live within the pain. There are going to be some unsolvable problems in your life. There are going to be unresolvable issues with people. There are times where your struggles will not have an end date, where your pain will not go away. Just ask anybody in this room with arthritis. <laughs> no matter how much you want that pain to go away, there's not a way to get rid of all of the discomfort all the time. Even though you badly want to get better and you badly want to feel better, it won't. I didn't ask to be born with clubbed hands and clubbed feet and it became a daily reality that I struggled with early on that this will be something that I have to live with and that I will have to have every day and that will never go away. There will be circumstances in your life where you will not be able to change it and where the pain will not go away no matter what you do or what you try. And it has nothing to do with your lack of faith. Paul wasn't struggling with a lack of faith when he asked the Lord to remove his thorn in the flesh. It has nothing to do with God mistreating you or not being there for you. There are just some pains that you will have to live with and you will never know why. And 
think about your relationships. Maybe you don't have the best relationship with your mom or your dad, or you're not close to them, and you're distant from them, and that distance seems to be growing every year. And sometimes it has nothing to do with sin on the part of that relationship that some people are just hard to get close to, and they put up barriers and defense mechanisms, and maybe something happened to them in the past, and they, you can't get close to them. There are quite a few fathers that I've known that are like that, and sometimes it looks like that relationship will be distant for your entire life. Sometimes grandparents don't live up to the definition of grandparents. They're not the hugs all day and give you everything you want, you know, and if you ask for a cookie, they'll go bake one for you, and, you know, the mentality of grandparents. Some grandparents are not like that. Sometimes your siblings will date and marry people that you don't like. Some of you are wanting to amen right now, but they're in this church building. (laughs) And now they've married people that you really don't get along with, and Christmas dinners and Thanksgiving will be more awkward than ever because you don't get along with those people. And there's nothing you can do about it because they're stuck. And you're stuck looking in, in the face Trying to eat turkey and be happy. Sometimes you will never be able to change a relationship to what you want it to be. And there's nothing you can do to change it. There are struggles in your life that will always be there. Some of you younger kids have dreams right now of making the six or seven figure job. I guess the seven one will be somewhere else. You have big plans after school, right, to make all the big bucks, but you may not have the $60,000 a year to go to college like Freed, and you didn't get the scholarship that you need to go there, and your parents aren't made of money like other people's parents are, and you have to change your plans, and the job that you're offered from the school that you go to isn't what you're expecting, and it's all that you can get, and it's a struggle, and there's nothing you can do about it. There are always going to be things that are out of your control that will not work out the way that you plan. And this is where envy and jealousy come in in a big way. We wanted something to happen to us, and now it's not going to. And someone else gets what we want simply because they were born into a richer family or they know more people or fill in the blank or whatever the situation. And we look at their perfect lives and look at their great jobs and we look at their awesome hair and all I have this stringy mess in my head and I'm married to a guy with a beard and... We get jealous because we can't get to where they are and we have to struggle and it seems like they're having the comfort and time of their life and we start to get angry and resentful that they can succeed where we've wanted to and they get what we want and we start to compare our lives to other people's life because they seem to have it better. And we look at their perfect vacations to far off places and we look at the picture of their 2.5 kids. It just doesn't make any sense to have 2.5 kids. Maybe that's what Solomon was doing when he wanted to cut the baby in half. Here's your point five. We look at other people's houses in the best subdivisions in town, and we look at their kids who, when they turn 16, get the nicest trucks and cars, and maybe we have to work every day to pay off our 2001 Toyota Camry that doesn't have power windows. We look at graduation announcements and we look at wedding announcements and baby announcements and invitations to important events and and we know that we'll never be able to travel like this person or that family and take a cruise every other month like them or even have the perfect family picture anymore and that'll always be right at the poverty line or always be middle class and won't be able to afford any type of nice house or nice place and the new trucks and new cars and have all the other resources everybody else has and that's where we begin to think things that we shouldn't. We start to think things that are unwise. We start to look at our struggles and situations and we start looking at, at the, the, the things that we have troubles with and the situations that we can't change and, and, and the, the pain that we have to live with, the struggles that will always be there and we're constantly wanting to get them out of the way and we say in our brains, nothing good can possibly come from this pain. Nothing good could possibly come from what I'm going through and nothing good can come from the place that I'm stuck at in my life right now. When they took Jenna home to be with Eddie and the kids during her last days, there was nothing that anyone could say to take away the pain of seeing that. When she died in her bedroom, And her kids came to kiss her goodbye. There was nothing that you could have said to console me.
And my mind went to a very unwise place. And I began to think my whole family has been Christians, my grandparents, my great-grandparents. We've raised our kids in the same way that my parents raised their kids. And God, this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not. And don't tell me what Romans 8.28 says, that all things work together for good. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me some story about how everything works out for good. Because that doesn't get me out of my pain. That was great for David and Abraham and Job, but that doesn't get me out of this place that I don't want to be in. The pain that I don't want to go through and the situation I do not want to see with my own eyes and it doesn't bring my sister back. And I could do nothing. And I was in control of nothing. And that place, in some way or another, is where we see so many people in the church. That place, in one way or another, is where I have seen so many young people that they say, if this is my life, if I'm always going to be struggling, then what is the point? Things are always going to be out of my control. What's the point? What's the point in continuing to go to Christmas dinner with people that I can't stand? What's the point of trying to work and work and work and I'm never going to get you know, that the six-figure job and I'm never going to live where I want to live? What's the point in making good grades if I can't get the scholarship to go to the school that I've always wanted to because it costs too much to get in? And what's the point of continuing in this path of life and trying to do all the good things that I can if I'm just going to struggle all the way to change what I can't change? You ever been there? My sister was flown to Vanderbilt after her last grand mal seizure. She lost consciousness, and the doctors came in after she had regained somewhat of it and said, Jenna was going to die. it be a few more days of being semi-conscious before the cancer took over her brain completely. And there was nothing I could do. Nothing. And I went down to my truck. I was parked in the Vanderbilt Hospital parking garage. And I beat on my steering wheel until I couldn't feel my hands. And I prayed, but it was more of me lashing out at God for not doing something, for not giving her more years, for not doing what I wanted him to do, for not giving her more time with her family and with her kids, and I thought that he was somewhere else, like he was going to do nothing to make my sister better. Where was he? There was no point in me praying for her to get better. What was the point of me praying for her at all when it came to this life? Because it was over. God, you're not going to take away this struggle, so what's the point? God, you're not doing what I think you should, so what in the world am I doing here? You're not giving me what I think that I should have. You're not giving me what I think that you should give my sister. You're not helping her out. This is out of my control. What's the point? Here's the lesson that I've learned since then. That there is this hypocrisy inside of us when we're struggling with hard things. When we're struggling with thorns that we can't control and that we can't change. We become the biggest hypocrites. And here's what I mean. There has been a time in your life, a weekend in your life, a spring break in your life, a date in your life, where God has been the farthest thing from your mind. 
That weekend where you're driving to a place to get in trouble on purpose, where you're driving to a party to do things you know that you shouldn't, where you're driving to pick up a date, where you know that you're going to do things that are against God's will, and when you're out with friends doing things and watching things you're not supposed to, and you're not thinking about God's presence at all during that day, and you're not praying, God, help me, you know, be pure with this girl as we're pulling down a back road and parking in the woods, and you're not playing the latest Devo songs in your car as you're making out, and you're, you're, you're planning on doing something before you get there and God is the farthest thing from your brain but man if he doesn't take me out of this struggle that I'm going through or this pain if he doesn't take away this thorn in the flesh that I'm having right now then he must not care about me and he must not be watching me and he must not care about what I'm going through and he must not see what I'm having to go through and he's not coming to help me immediately so he must not care about the struggles that I am living in my life Here's the thing. He has seen you and watched you just as much in your struggle as when you were choosing to sin. And there are plenty of you that have had doubts in this room. In a room like this, I'm sure there's more than a few. There are those of you who have been overwhelmed with struggles and pains, and here's what I want you to see if that's you. You are not alone in your struggle. I have had doubts. I have had questions. I have had pains. I have had times where I did not know what to do with my faith, and there is not a person in this room that will be completely honest with you if they do not tell you they have had the same. We all struggle with times that we are overwhelmed, that we don't know what to do, where the struggle seems to be all that's on the horizon and life is not getting any better. And it helps us to know that other people of faith struggle too. That I can be a follower of God and not know all the answers. That I can follow Christ and still have periods of doubt in my life. There was an apostle named Thomas who even got a nickname, but he was still an apostle. Doubting Thomas. Well, that was the introduction. (laughs) So let's uh, turn to the lesson uh, text in Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. To set this up, Matthew 11, we'll go back to Matthew 4 in just a minute. John the Baptist has been arrested and put into prison. And he's been in prison for some time when you get to Matthew chapter 11. Jesus is in Galilee with some of his core disciples. And a group of John's disciples come to find Jesus and ask Jesus a question from John the Baptist who is sitting in prison. And here's the question that John asks through his disciples to Jesus. Are you really the one we're looking for? Are you really Jesus? Are you really the Christ, the one that we're looking for? Now, if you know John the Baptist's life at all, that doesn't sound like John the Baptist. If you know all the things that John did, all the things that John said, that doesn't sound like John the Baptist. But where was John when he was asking the question? John was in prison, okay, which is a pretty big struggle. I can't think of somewhere where I would want to get out of more in the ancient day than a prison or a dungeon. It seems like something that was totally out of my control when I'm in a dungeon. But John the Baptist was there because he had made some people in the Jewish government very upset, specifically King Herod. And he told King Herod he was living in sin and needed to repent, which was John's favorite sermon. If you ever read about John the Baptist, it was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. King Herod married his niece, which is gross even in Kentucky. Some of you didn't get that one. And taking her away from her other uncle, which is just weird. And this is a big scandal in Jewish culture, okay? Herodias, the girl, the niece, 
You know, and John the Baptist is going around telling everyone that this is a ridiculously sinful woman for everything that they have done. So Herodias gets her new boyfriend slash uncle to throw John the Baptist into prison for telling them to straighten up and live right and stop marrying your nieces and stuff. And according to Jewish history, Herod has John thrown into a particular dungeon at the edge of his territory in a desert. So I'm sure this place is like the Hilton <laughs> inside of an oven. So John's in a little bit of a pickle. He's in a little bit of a struggle. And uh, he, it's totally out of his hands because he's in prison. Kind of a big thorn. Time goes by, time goes by, time goes by. From Matthew chapter 4 to Matthew chapter 11. And John's still stuck in prison. Nobody comes to get him out. John seems to have what we have in those thorn in the flesh moments that are out of our control. John seems to have some doubt. He's struggling. Jesus hadn't come to see him. He hadn't gotten a card saying, I'll be there next week. I'll open up the gates for you and you'll just walk right out. He's struggling. Where's God? Who are you really? Because if you had the power that you say you did, you will come and help me. I'm in a hundred degree oven being served next to nothing as far as food and there seems to be no end to the struggle. I've been here for a year. I've devoted my entire life to doing what God tells me to do and it seems like I've been forgotten. And Jesus loved John the Baptist. They were cousins. Not the kind of cousin that you don't like. The ones that come over and break all your stuff or borrow it and never return it. You have those. Jesus loved John the Baptist. And they've known each other for a very long time. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus says this, Truly I say unto you, among, the born, among those born of women there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist loved Jesus. When John saw Jesus for the first time, John announces to the world in John chapter 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He paved the way for Christ. He says, he must increase, I must decrease. Here's the thing, now that we've set up all the context in Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew 4 and verse 11 and 12, when Jesus hears that John the Baptist has been put in prison in the desert and he's in, in a bit of a, a, a struggle and John's in pain, Jesus did not go see him. Jesus did not drop everything and go to break him out of prison or visit him in prison. He didn't send an angel to break him out like he did with Peter. He, he didn't use his power to rescue John. Jesus did not come to John the Baptist in his greatest hour of struggle. So what do you think Jesus, the Son of God, who loved and complimented John with the highest compliment that you could give to anybody among those born of women, there's no one greater than John the Baptist. What do you think Jesus did in John's greatest hour of struggle? Jesus withdrew to Galilee and went to live in Capernaum. He went the opposite direction. John's left in prison. Probably a year, some commentators say it's a year and a half. And the prison system during that time was, was not like the one we have today in America, where prisoners have riots and, you know, they have uh, give meals given to them every day and TV and wreck time. No, 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 no. You see, if you were in prison during that day, you had to have somebody on the outside bring you food or you starved. So John's there roasting for a year, struggling. He starts hearing about Jesus doing all these miracles and doing all these marvelous and glorious things outside where he can't be and outside of the bars that he is inside of. And he starts hearing about Jesus doing all these miracles and all these powerful, wonderful works. And what do you think John is asking himself? What about me? Why doesn't Jesus use these powers to break me out? So it comes to a point where John tells his disciples, can you go and ask this Jesus, are you really the one that we're looking for or should we be looking for someone else? This is John the Baptist we're talking about. No greater man born of woman than John the Baptist and guess what he had? Same thing that you do. Struggle, doubt, fear. And Jesus sends John's disciples back with a message to John the Baptist. He says, I want you to tell John this, that, the, that I'm healing the lame, and the lepers are being cleansed, and the dead are being raised. 
Now, what would we expect Jesus to do in that particular situation? What would we expect Jesus to do for someone that he loved so much that he complimented so highly? What would we expect Jesus to do? John the Baptist is rotten in prison. He's a guy that, that, that Jesus loves. He's about to have his head served on a silver platter to Herodias. What would we expect God, the Son, filled with compassion to do? Well, you know what he says? Verse 6 is the punchline of the whole conversation. Matthew 11, verse 6, Jesus kind of attaches this, and if you don't, if you just read through it, you won't get it. He says this, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me, or who does not stumble on account of me. Now, what does that mean? Jesus says, we're blessed when in spite of all of the struggles that we go through, in spite of all the circumstances that we have to live through, in spite of all the things that we can't change, that we still trust him. Jesus is telling John, blessed are you and you still believe in me? Even though it seems everything is out of your control. Now how hard is that? How hard is that when you're in pain, when you're in trouble, when that storm keeps coming and keeps going? When you're in a situation that doesn't seem to have a way out? When you're watching your sister die? Or you're in a desert, in a dungeon? That's hard. You see, God will hold your life in his hand no matter the struggle. And it might take you a lifetime to figure that out. But he will never leave you or forsake you. What God has given us is worth more than any pain from any thorn that we can endure in this life. He gave you Jesus, his only begotten son. And when things seem out of control, the cross puts things back into perspective. And if that's where you need to come tonight, then come to him and lay all your cares and burdens and sorrows on your Savior because he cares for you. Or maybe you need to call on his name as you're baptized to wash away your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16. If you've lost your focus or you're going through a struggle that has made you not see God in the way that you should, we're here to pray for you, with you, to put our hands around you. There are others in this room that have struggled in the same way that you have. Though some of them have not admitted nor asked for any type of help or prayer. Just know that they have struggled the same way. And they will pray for you as ardently as they have prayed for themselves. So if you need that, won't you come? So together we stand and sing.
life-touching lesson. John David comes tonight very touched by what Josh has said. And he and he's good friends with Josh. Josh loves him. He loves Josh. And he has asked that Josh would lead a prayer for him tonight. So we would like for Josh to do that. Father, we come to you thankful that we have this uh, avenue of prayer to talk to you. As our Father, thankful that you gave your Son as that sacrifice so that we could come before you pure and holy. We ask you to forgive all of us for our transgressions so that you will indeed hear the things that we uh, are asking you. And Father, we come before you on behalf of uh, John David. I'm thankful for him, Father. I'm thankful for the life that he has chosen to live when it comes to being a part of your son, when it comes to walking with him. Father, we know there are many struggles, and we ask you to help him to give his burdens to you. Help him to see on the path that he is walking where there's temptation, where there's sin. And Father, to help him through some of the doubts and some of the questions that he uh, might have along the way. Father, at this present time, we ask you to take away those burdens. And we ask you to help him to be the example that he desires to be to his friends, to his family, and to always have the heart to cast his burden on you. Father, we're thankful for him, and we ask you to continue to bless his walk so that Christ can be seen in others, uh, that Christ can be seen by others in him. Once again, we ask your forgiveness. Give us a penitent heart every day so that we can walk with you. We pray in Christ's name. Hasn't it been good to be here tonight? You know, to call someone a friend, and we call Josh Herndon a friend, and he calls us a friend. Because if you're not a friend, you don't share something that personal. And God bless you for that, Josh, to give you the courage, the strength, and the wisdom to open your heart up and to pour it out on so many that need it poured out on. And I know that God will bless you for that. We hurt when our friends hurt. Jesus taught us that. And we hurt when we hear stories that others have encountered that in which life has been so difficult. But what we sometimes don't do is let that hurt be noticed and how that hurt can be turned into something positive and good and helpful. And this lesson tonight will help us to do that because we all have struggles and if we haven't, we will. And we have all probably had doubt. And if we haven't, we, we may. God bless you, John David, for you coming forward. And we need to understand and teach our young people that that's what they need to do. There is no shame in walking down the aisle. There is reward in letting your feelings be known with your Christian family. And that's what the body of believers is all about. Is being willing to open up and to let people see you and to feel you and to know you. 
So God bless you for that lesson, Josh. Thank you for coming our way. I like your beard. Maybe the only person that I would like to see it on more would be David Palmer, so he has more hair above his shoulders. <laughs> David and I are good friends. But so good to see you tonight and to have you. And this, this worship service is something that I know will help us in our everyday lives. Let us go to our Father for the last time in prayer, and they will be dismissed. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we've had together here tonight. We're thankful, Father, for this good message and for this good messenger. We pray, Father, that you would give Josh a long life in your service. Father, he has the heart of a preacher and a true Christian and a true friend. And thank you, Father, for guiding his words tonight and giving him the strength that he needed to deliver this message. Help us to use this message to cleanse our lives of doubt and to prepare our lives for struggle. And help us, Father, to be better servants unto thee and help us be a light at the end of the tunnel for others that are struggling or in doubt. And let us be that servant that you would have us to be. Thank you for John David that has come forward tonight and offered himself as an example. And thank you for the prayer that was led in his behalf. If there's others, Father, may they also feel free and willing to come and to share their commitment with, with this body of believers, with this family, and with you. Continue to bless us and forgive us where we err. This prayer we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. You are dismissed at this time.